Hi, my name is Maxine Hunter. I'm the residential horticulture agent in Marion County um, for UFIFAS Extension. Um, we're going to talk today about weeds in your garden and some of the control mechanisms that you can use to help prevent them and also uh, keep them under wraps. We're going to cover why it's important to control weeds in the first place. Broadleafs versus grasses and sedges, the three types of weeds that we deal with. A little bit of terminology for you when you're trying to identify weeds, and then also using the web to identify weeds if you don't have proper keys or uh, books. Um, control methods, and then lastly, a few examples of problematic weeds that we see and um, resources that are available to you. So why is weed control so critical? First, we have roughly $500 million in losses in Florida agriculture due to weeds annually. Secondly, we have 75% of all pesticide sales in Florida are from herbicides. And then lastly, um, weeds provide unique challenges in all areas, but especially in ornamental and turf areas where um, you have to control the competition that they provide. Um, so because they do reduce the availability of nutrients and other resources to the plants that are, you are trying to reach. Um, and also aesthetics are critical. Many of us want that um, picturesque home or landscape, including our turf grass and ornamental beds and weeds will creep up on us very quickly. So what is a weed? I always like to tell my clients that a uh, weed is in the eye of the beholder. Some people see native plants that creep into areas that they're not supposed to be and they consider those a weed. Some people see things that have a pretty flower that many of us would consider a weed and they don't think it's a weed. So a weed is really um, dependent on your perspective, what you're trying to grow and where it's being found. Any plant can be a weed and it's, the technical definition would be is any plant that's out of place. So as you can see in this picture, there's many weeds that come up in areas that we don't think they should be. And um, depending on where that location is, can determine how hard it is to control them. So what does this mean in terms of control? First, many problematic weed species may not be in identification books or on websites even. Um, weeds can occur in turf, they can occur in vegetable gardens, they can occur in ornamental beds, or they might be in an agricultural setting. So um, it really determines where that setting is as far as what our control options are. And often these weeds are found in a little bit of all of these areas, so they're not super picky on which area they show up in. So one example of this might be a weed that shows up in uh, my landscape at the office may not be problematic, but if it shows up here at my home, it could be problematic if it's toxic to livestock or if there's other issues that um, could make it problematic for whatever is growing in that area. So for example, if we've got edibles growing that we would harvest and there's a toxic weed, we would have concern with that. So why does identification matter? First of all, proper identification is the very first step in integrated pest management, and that is the system that we use to approach all weed and pest problems. And it gives you the ability to use efficacy tables, to properly use herbicide label information, and also follow university and industry recommendations, which also often make you more successful. Um, also, identifying your weeds properly can give you um, an insight to other problems that you may not know are even going on. There are many weed species that are actually indicator weeds, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So some examples of indicator species are um, red sorrel can be an indicator of low soil pH, whereas broadleaf plantain actually can be an indicator of high soil pH. Um, goosegrass is often an indicator of compaction. Florida pulsely, which is very common in our area, um, and also spurges can be a great indicator that uh, nematodes are present. Remember that nematodes are very common and are native in our native sandy soils, 
but they can be problematic for our ornamental plants and for our vegetable gardens. Sedges, doveweeds, and uh, eclipta can be um, noticeable in wet sites and might be signaling that you've got an irrigation leak or some other problem that uh, is causing a little bit more wetness than normal. Clovers and leg legumes will do well in low nitrogen areas. And then uh, poa and chickweed will actually do well with low mowing, um, which can be an indicator that you're scalping your lawn. So identifying characteristics that we look for. Um, first, we look to see if the weed is a monocot versus a dicot. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this terminology, a dicot is a broadleaf weed. So this is pretty simple to um, determine between the two. A uh, monocot will only have uh, two leaves that start when you sprout it, so if you find it when it's just emerging. Um, Broadleafs versus grass versus sedges. So um, obviously broadleafs have net-like veins that spread out and are more common. There's many, 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 many species of broadleafs. Your grasses are going to have your more parallel veins in your leaf shape. And then lastly, your sedges, remember sedges have edges. So if you feel something that looks kind of similar to a grass, but is more either triangular shaped or it could even be almost like a square shape where it's got edges, that's very much going to be a sedge. Um, your annuals versus your biannuals and perennials, um, what growing season it lives in, these are all important for control. So it's important that we know what the characteristics of the weed are. And then how it grows, whether it's erect versus prostrate or rosette, or if it's even climbing. And then lastly, how it reproduces, whether it reproduces vegetatively, via bulbs or via um, roots, versus sexual reproduction with seeds. When we talk about weed identification, some of the first things that we have to look at are the flowers or fruits. Sometimes though, it's best if we don't wait this long. Um, for my particular job as an extension agent, this makes my job much more difficult because the easiest time to identify weeds is when they are fruiting or have flowers on them because you usually have a specific shape or number of leaf petals or number of, um, number of petals or number of um, stamen and also uh, flower color. There's many different characteristics that go along with the flowers and the fruits that can help us get a specific identification. But the problem with this is if we wait that long, normally they've had a chance to reproduce and therefore they're going to be there for much longer periods of time. So the earlier you can get the weeds out of your garden, the more successful you're going to be. Um, so if that's not a possibility, some other options are looking at the growth habitat. Um, where is it growing at? What is the color? Does it have a smell to it if you crush the leaves on your finger? How does it feel? Is it fuzzy or is it very glossy? Um, what season is it growing in? And then of course, where is the placement of it that it's out of place in? So whether it's a sunny or shady area, dry or wet, and many other um, classifications we can look at. And our goal is in this is to identify and control it before it's able to re replicate because oftentimes weeds are considered weeds because they replicate so efficiently. Um, also when it comes to using herbicides, um, herbicides are actually much more effective when the weeds are at a younger life stage. Um, so the younger the better and we want to apply the least amount of herbicides possible. So as I just was saying about the herbicides, this is a great example of when to apply herbicides if that's the route you want to take. If you notice in the top left-hand corner, the weeds are just beginning to germinate. They're very small. They're at a young juvenile stage. Whereas in the middle, you've got weeds that are almost mature, maybe not reproductive um, active yet, but they are getting there. And in the last stage, they are fully mature and are already reproducing and putting seeds back in the ground. So you're going to have a continued problem. So again, the top left is the best time to treat for um, weed problems and the bottom right picture is the worst. So where do we start? First of all, when we're talking about weed pests, we want to make sure if we're working with a monocot or grass-like plant, or dicot or broadleaf, 
Or lastly, there are some algal species that we do occasionally deal with that are actually primitive weeds and don't produce seeds. And we can talk a little bit about those later. So furthermore, if it is a grass species, then we need to look and see if it does have edges and if it is a sedge species. There's many of sedges, including um, yellow and purple nut sedge, there's globe sedge, there's cylindrical sedge, there are so many different sedge species, but thankfully, sedges are generally pretty easy to distinguish between. So where do we start? We need to know the, what the life cycle is. So once we're starting to look at the identification, um, annuals are the easiest to control. They only survive one year, but they do usually produce prolific seeds. Biannuals live two years, and then perennials live more than two years and are the most difficult weeds to control. Life cycles do have an effect on the control um, because often uh, annuals will germinate after the soil is disturbed and this is a big problem with new plants and turf establishment, vegetable gardens after we till, um, and it's, they are the most common, but they're also the easiest to control. We usually control them with contact or systemic herbicides. Pre-emergent herbicides are very effective, um, and mulches are also effective. And yes, you can use mulch in your uh, vegetable garden, so if that's a concern, uh, definitely look into the source of where you're getting the mulch from, but there are many mulches out there that are appropriate for vegetable gardens. I personally like to use a uh, very small pine bark, but there's many options. Next, we have biannuals. There aren't too many weeds that are biannuals. Systemic herbicides work best on these, but pre-emergents are not as effective. And then lastly, we have our perennials, and these are the ones that usually give us a headache. These are common invaders of uh, newly established lawns. They also can often come in with new soils. So if you bring in large truckloads of soils, um, and unfortunately they often have storage organs that can help them wait long periods of time before they germinate and regrow. So it's important that we control them before we start in, uh, stalling our turf or our vegetable garden. And we can do this with using uh, systemic herbicides um, but pre-emergents are not as effective. So um, there is a pre-emergent out there specifically for vegetable gardens. It's called Preen, and I believe there is one other as well. So if you're looking into doing pre-emergent herbicides, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me, and I can get you the information on that. Most of the people I work with with vegetable gardens prefer not to apply herbicides, so um, we fully support that, and um, I will talk a little bit about the control methods that are available to you in just a moment. So let's talk a little bit about monocots. These are our grassy weeds. Um, I have some of them in my grass um, or in my vegetable garden, um, including bahia grass, um, torpedo grass occasionally. I try to get that out of there. Um, thankfully, I haven't had any kogan grass, but I do get goose grass and alexander grass as well. So there's no shortage of grassy weeds. Um, grassy weeds only have one cotyledon and one seed leaf um, when they germinate, and then once a single leaf emerges, they have a hollow or rounded flattened stems. These have closed hard nodes and parallel veins, as we mentioned before. Next, we have monocots that are sedges, and again, these are grass-like, but they're not true grasses, and remember, sedges have edges. These are usually solid triangular shaped stems and they extend in three directions. Um, sedges can be annuals and perennials. Um, perennials can be very tough to control. Um, I know in my landscape, I've got globe sedge and I've been fighting it for years and I've pretty much given up the good fight and just figure I'll mow it until it blends in. Uh, monocot ID is usually done by looking at the leaf arrangement um, or stem arrangement and also the different nodes. So usually you can take a look at a grass and it'll have a um, round stem, whereas the stems and leaves of the sedge are more flat, they lay flat, and they also have, uh, sedges have a fused leaf at the base of the stem, whereas grasses will have an overlapping leaf sheath. So um, there are some very distinct 
um, recognitions between leaf arrangement and the stem and the leaf between a grass and a sedge. Um, also, grasses usually have an alternate leaf arrangement, whereas a sedge will have a spiral um, leaf arrangement. A little bit more on grass identification. Um, we do get a lot of grass samples in and they can be extremely difficult to ID. So some of the things that you're gonna wanna look for are the ligules. Um, we sometimes put these underneath the microscope to look at these and the collars and also um, the spikelets or seed heads. Um, those can help in IDing the in grass ID confirmation. So very important to know which grass you're working with to be able to get the proper identification and control. Um, when we're working with grasses and sedges, we have to look at the inflorescence type. There are quite a few of them. So like we mentioned before with the spikelets, you might, might also have uh, panicles, which are spikelets born on stalks. So, or you might have the racemes, which are directly on the main axis. So there's a few different types that we can look at to make sure that we're working with the correct identification. Here's some actual examples of the differences between the panicles, the racemes, and the spikes. So um, these are good pictures. We won't go into the specific idea of each of these grasses right now, but we will in a little bit. Um, but definitely looking at these seed heads is crucial for proper identification. But again, we'd prefer not to let them get to this mature stage before we get the proper identification and remove them from our garden. Now let's jump into dicots. Um, dicots are our broadleaf weeds. They have two cotyledons inside the seed coat, and when they germinate, you'll see two leaves emerge versus just one in the monocots. They are very highly variable in appearance. They typically have showy flowers and net-like veins. A few differences in some of the things that we'll look at when we're identifying monocot, I'm sorry, dicots um, are first of all the habit that they're growing. So whether they're um, ascending or growing upwards, sprawling, creeping, or climbing, we can have a couple species that look very similar to each other, and that habit can um, help us distinguish between the two. Next, we have leaf margins. Um, there are so many different leaf margins out there. We'll only talk a little bit about this. We have leaf shapes, also how the leaf attaches to the plant, the leaf tips, leaf bases, and leaf arrangements all go into the identification processes for dicots. Other ways to ID these include looking at the root structures, the flowers, and the fruit. Um, so what are we looking at when we're talking about the growth habit? We talked a little bit about this, and you can see here mm -hmm. on the bottom left, we have a um, spurge that is creeping, also called prostrate. We have a philanthus that's upright or erect. We have a vine that is climbing or ascending. And then we've got a basal rosette at the bottom. So these do make a big difference when we're talking about identification. Some common leaf arrangements that we see are opposite, alternate, world, and again the basal rosette. So all of these are distinguishing characteristics that will help us with the final identification. Looking at leaf margins can really be helpful. Um, so you might have a toothed or serrated um, leaf margin or you might have a smooth or entire leaf margin. Also look for the presence of hairs. So if you've got a hairless leaf or hairless stems, um, it would also be called glabrous. Or if it's hairy or pubescent, um, that's a very big distinguishing characteristic. So um, there aren't too many dicots out there that have um, hairy leaves and hairy stems. So that is a very big characteristic that if it is present, it makes identification a little easier. And then looking at the root structure, whether they have a tap root, tubers, rhizomes, um, stolons, bulbs, or even a corm. So oftentimes if they do um, have rhizomes or tubers, they can be very different, difficult to control because they're gonna spread um, in multiple ways. 
And then lastly, we won't get big into the study of the flower structure, but if you do get to a point where your weed has flowers on it, identifying the different structures of the flower, including the number of stamens um, and the number of um, petals can be very key to uh, getting a correct identification. And then of course, basic things. So like the style of flower that it is, the um, color of the flower, all of these, the size of the flower, all these go into um, consideration when we're talking about identification. Here's some examples of flower structures. So you can see the evening primrose is solitary, got a very pretty little yellow cupped flower. Uh, the Dallas grass has a raceme. Uh, plant, plantain actually has a um, big spikelet. Wild carrot has umbel. And then horseweed has panicles. And fleabane has a corium. Oops, sorry, I'm getting attacked by a bee here. Um, other ID methods, looking at the height and lateral spread, size does make a difference. Um, the branching and arrangement of branches on the main stem, leaf size, the leaf and stem color and shape. Sometimes you'll have a leaf or stem that has more of a red or burgundy color to it. Um, and then lastly, if it has a smell or taste, if you dare, um, I don't recommend tasting things when you don't know what they are because some of them are toxic. So take that into consideration before you go tasting leaves. Um, but crushing them and smelling them can be very effective. So a little bit more about the habitat and uh, cultural practices. Uh, like we talked about at the very beginning, weeds will grow pretty much anywhere where there's a vacant space. So having um, plants down and mulch down can actually be a good preventative in itself. If you have bare areas, weeds are highly likely to come up. And as you can see in this picture, this is an example of a PVC pipe that has Florida Pulsely growing all the way up through it. And this is normally a low growing sprawling plant, but it found a space and it made it fit. Also, when you're talking about identifying weeds, there's some fantastic resources out there, so you don't have to go this alone. Um, first and foremost, my very favorite is the Weeds of Southern Turf Grass, and I believe you can still find this on Amazon, although because it has been pulled, it may be more costly than what is reasonable. So next we have the Weeds of the South, or you could check out the Vascular Flora of the Carolinas. Um, and that's the manual of the vascular floor of the Carolinas. And then we also have our EDIS website, which is our electronic database and information source for the University of Florida IFAS extension. And that is edis, e -D -I -S, dot U-F-L dot E-D-U. And there's so many topics there and weeds is certainly a big one. Um, and then of course, don't forget, we at your local extension office are here to help you and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So what if you need to go online because you don't have a weed book? What are some of the things that you can put into a Google search to help you get the right identification? First of all, you can see in the left top picture, this particular weed has a white milky sap that's very characteristic and will help you get an identification. That particular weed, which is a spurge, also has opposite leaves. It has serrated margins and hairy red stems. And it's also growing in cracks with a low spreading habitat. All of these different terms will come to play in your favor when you do a Google search. The more descriptive you can be, the better that you're going to get um, pictures that might match what you're looking for. Also, these days where there's a lot of um, apps on your smartphone that can help you with weed identification as well. So once you enter some of these particular terms, and you put a descriptive um, search in the box, you're gonna get a whole bunch of pictures that pop up. I like to go straight to images, and then you'll see something similar to what you have here. From there, you've gotta just start investigating, finding something that looks similar to what you were looking for, and then you can click on it and see if it goes to a reliable website. If it doesn't go to a reliable website, does it at least give you a name? If it does give you a name and it's something that looks exactly like or even very similar like the weed that you're holding, 
you can take that name and cross-reference it with our EDA status um, base or other reliable websites to make sure that you're correct. Don't ever go off of just some random website because you may not have the correct identification, but um, you can start searching like this and it is a very useful tool. So some of the weeds that we see frequently, first and foremost, spurges. These are summer annuals. There are quite a few different spurges. I know here at my house I get the spotted spurge um, very frequently and also the sand mat spurge and the hyssop spurge. I see all of those almost on a daily basis as I check my gardens, but thankfully I pull them when they're small and don't have too many issues. So these spurges have opposite toothed um, and hairs by the base, so their leaf arrangement is very characteristic. They are erect and have glabrous um, leaves and kind of had a red tinge to the stem, so that's very characteristic for spurges. They may have a white flower or appear clustered. They have tap roots if you pull them up. And then the easy identification points is they do produce a milky sap if you break the leaf in half. They have reddish stems and spotted leaves with seed clusters. Next, we have oxalis or wood sorrel. This is a spring or summer annual, and it will actually grow into the fall and winter. It has three very characteristic heart-shaped leaflets. It's light green to a reddish purple color, and it can um, have erect stems, but they're very weak and they are branched at the base. The flowers that are produced by oxalis are um, yellow, um, they have five petals, they have green capsules for fruit, and also become very thin when they are maturing because they actually um, explode and send seeds out for quite a distance away from the plant. So one of their tricky little weed reproduction mechanisms. So some examples for easy identification are, you could look at it and it kind of looks like tiny okra fruit, and also of course the heart leaves and three, um, pairs of three, so very characteristic for oxalis and pretty easy to um, identify. So, and of course you do have um, other colors of flowers, so yellow and purple are the two um, colors of flowers that you'll look for in oxalis. Next we have black medic. This has got a nice yellow flower on it. This can be um, misidentified for several other plants including our creeping indigo. I've had several people that have brought this to me with concerns and um, it's not creeping indigo. It's a separate species that is not toxic. At least I don't think it's toxic. I should look that up. But um, it's very common in our um, pastures and our vegetable gardens and in our ornamental beds. Next we have Eclipta. This is a summer annual. It has reddish to brown um, and purple root nodes, so you can see that the stem color is not a glossy green. It has small white flowers. The roots are um, fibrous. They have a very shallow tap root, and the easy way to identify this is if you search for uh, button-like green flowers or a black seed head, some of those will pop up with Eclipta for your Google search when you start. Next, we have bittercress or hairy bittercress, a um, couple different um, species we have here. These are winter annuals. They have a basil rosette for leaves. They are thin and green. Uh, they have small white flowers, and again, they do like to have their seed heads explode, sending seeds far away. These are very common in our vegetable gardens. They have fibrous roots, and their um, easy ID characteristics are they have cigar-shaped fruit that pop when mature. We have spreading chinchweed. This is an annual that has four to 12 pairs of setae. These stems on this plant are prostrate to ascending and they can be very much mat forming. This is one we'll start to see here soon because it does flower from July to November. It can be very in, uh, inconspicuous between the time that it gets started and the time that it actually starts to flower. It has fibrous roots and again it has a uh, mat forming um, 
characteristics and yellow flowers. Next, we have the tassel flowers. This one pops up often in our greenhouse areas as well as in our vegetable gardens. It's a summer annual. When it gets ready to bloom, it's got a very tiny but pretty, almost pink or coral colored flower. Um, it's wider at the base. Um, it is, does have a hairy um, stem when young. And then the flowers can vary slightly between a reddish coral color to light purple. It has small seed heads. It has dandelion-like white globes, but it does have a taproot. So that's a little different than some of the other weeds that we've looked at. Once you see this weed, you'll easily identify it, um, but it's very common in our area. Next, we talked about the plants that are, are weeds that are not in the monocot or dicot family. And this is one example that we get a lot of questions about. And often it's associated with wet areas, um, but this can be in greenhouse areas. It can also be in potted plants or containers, and it's called nostoc. And it falls in the blue-green algae family, so a lot of people have questions on it. It is a primitive weed, and it is rootless, and it is actually a cyanobacteria. It is a dark green uh, gelatinous mass, and it appears often on the top of soil, plastic, ground cloth, other gravel, and even sometimes on turf. Um, it can be very slick, so please don't step on it. You may go sliding and not be very happy with this. Um, but this is one that we do get a lot of questions on. Next, you have a uh, dayflower or tropical spiderwort. This is a perennial. It can also act like as an annual, but um, I have seen it as a perennial in Marion County. Um, it's broadly ovate with its leaf shape. Uh, it has entire modger, um, margins, parallel veins. It can be pubescent. Um, it is erect or prostrate. Um, it can root at the node, so it grows very, very rapidly and spreads quickly. It often flowers in clusters with funnel-shaped violet to light blue um, colored flowers. They are very pretty. Um, and it can produce a significant number of flowers and seeds. The roots are fibrous, and the easiest way to identify it is if you look at the white underground stems the color of the flowers and the shape and uh, size of the flowers, along with the wide parallel veins and wide leaves. Our next weed is doveweed. And this is very common in our area. It is a summer annual in the spiderwort family. It has leaves that are two to five inches long and um, parallel veins. It has alternate and clasping um, nodes right around the stem. The stems are succulent. It roots at the nodes, so it makes it spread easier. The flowers are a blue to purple color, and they are in open clusters with short stalks. The easy way to identify it is if you look at the thick green leaves, and it roots at the nodes in thick clumps. The next one we have is the famous ragweed. Many people have allergies to ragweed. Um, it is an annual. The leaves are alternate on it and it can form a basal rosette. Um, it is very finely lobed and pubescent. It is an erect plant. Um, the flowers on it are white disc shaped flowers. It does have a tap root. Um, and if you're trying to easily identify it, it is a light green um, to white pubescent on flowers. And it has white flowers, also called white top sometimes. Another fun leaf that we get in the vegetable gardens are artillery weeds. They are annuals and can actually be perennials as well. They are succulent. They have opposite leaf arrangements, light green leaves. They are thin. Um, green stems and they have tiny white to green or brown fruits. Their roots are fibrous and they almost have a fern-like appearance. Next we have a crown orchid. This can pop up um, in mulched areas. If you have mulched areas around your garden um, or have brought soil in, this is similar to a daylily. Um, 
it does have a pseudo bulb and it has long shoots with a race me full of flowers. You can see the flowers are like a light pink to coral color. So let's talk, those were just a few weeds. There's hundreds of weeds out there. So if you have other weeds and you need help identifying, we're going to talk about how to get pictures and submit samples. But let's talk about some things you can do for control. First and foremost, the key to controlling weeds in your garden is prevention. So that means getting a nice clear slate before you get started. Um, it can mean physical and mechanical control methods, including um, cultivation, tilling, solarization during the summer, and hand pulling. Nobody wants to hear hand pulling weeds is the best control method out there, but honestly it is. It's more thorough than some of the other methods. And of course, if you're working with a vegetable garden, um, it's going to be the healthiest option available too. Um, if you're going to apply pre-emergent herbicides, be sure to read the label. You always need to read the label on any kind of herbicide or pesticide product anyways, but you'll need to know how long you have to wait before you can plant. Pre-emergence can be good because they can stop um, seeds that have been in the soil for long periods of time from germinating, but they can also stop any vegetable seeds and stunt the growth of other plants as well. So, and then of course your post-emergent herbicides are herbicides that you can use after the fact. So once they've come out of the ground and um, depending on the different life stage will depend on how effective they are and also choosing the right herbicide. Um, for vegetable gardens specifically, I don't recommend herbicides much at all. Um, generally speaking, I highly recommend hand pulling using a hoe or rake and getting uh, mechanical um, or physical methods to get the weeds out. So what happens if you're stumped? You can't find the answer. You're not sure what the weed is that you're working with. The best thing you can do is collect a plant sample. The more the better. That doesn't mean we need a five gallon bucket, but usually if you bring us one leaf, there's not a lot we can do with it. Flowers are fantastic for identification purposes. And then different stages of the growth, because sometimes if you just bring us a very newly germinated plant, it will look very different at the adult stage. You usually will want to store this in a plastic bag with a wet paper towel on the roots to try to keep it um, moist so it doesn't shrivel up and keep it in a cool location until you get it to us. You can bring this to the extension office or one of the research locations that we have. Um, the MREC plant clinic is in Apopka and that is open every Tuesday. Our plant clinic in Marion County is open five days a week, Monday through Friday, um, with general hours of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for the plant clinic. Obviously, during COVID-19, our plant clinic is not open to the public for walk-ins, but you are welcome to call and make an appointment and we'll be happy to accommodate you. Good photos. Um, we are usually very easy um, to identify weeds by email or by text. And uh, the key to this is getting good photographs. So overall growth habit are some things that we'll look at. Close-ups of the leaf shape, stems, and root system. So we need the whole plant. Looking at the seeds and flower types, including the flower um, color and um, the shape. Um, sometimes we'll need information on where you're located and um, what the site was that you pulled this from. So use something for a key, so whether it be to show us the size of the plant, whether it be a pencil or a quarter, um, but something to show us what size the actual plant is that you're working with. And then preferably use a solid background. So whether it be a tailgate or hood of a truck, paper in the background or a notepad, um, but something would be great if it's solid color and not brightly colored because that takes away from us being able to see some of the true characteristics. These are some examples of good photos. Um, all of these together, obviously the one in the bottom middle would not be good by itself, neither would the one on the right. Um, but when you add all three of these together, this gives us a really pretty good description of the Florida Pulsey plant that you're seeing here. Another example of some good photos um, you can see this shows some very specific characteristics um, as well as the pubescent hairs on the leaves and um, the low sprawling habitat. These are examples of bad photos. 
please don't send us these because we will send you back an email that says we really appreciate you sending us photos but we can't tell anything about what we're looking at so um, I've gotten emails from people asking what do I spray and generally speaking until we get an identification we will not make any recommendations on treatment um, if you have further questions or have weed samples that you're concerned with, again, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're here to help you at Extension, and we look forward to it. In fact, weed samples are one of my favorite things to get in. Um, there are some additional web resources that you can use, though, including the USDA plant database, and that is at plants.usda.gov. There's the Atlas of Florida Vascular Plants, and, of course, our UF Extension Weed Science Unit. And we have a... Um, Weed ID at the University of Tennessee as well as Vermont. Oh, my screen is going away here. So um, these are just a few examples. I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation and um, let us know what we can do to help you. And uh, we'll hope to see some samples from you in the future.